Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. When you come back, I'm gonna talk about a subject that I haven't talked about for a while on my channel, and that's my big green egg. It's the thing that got me started on my YouTube channel. Somebody asked me about the crack that developed that I fixed two years ago on this egg. I'm gonna show you what's going on with that, and then we're gonna make something special on the big green egg. Come right back, we'll get started. Hey everybody, Richard, little bit of everything. Welcome back to the channel. So yeah, as you saw in my thumbnail and as you saw in the intro, we're gonna talk about the big green egg today. And that big green egg started my journey down YouTube when I found that thing on um, a barbecue post. Somebody was selling really cheap. I went and picked it up. I ended up refurbishing it. I made several videos on that. And one of the videos that I made on there introduced <clears throat> a crack that was in the uh, bottom of the big green egg and I figured out a way to fix it um, by using some um, high heat compound. Um, that was two years ago. I've probably cooked two dozen times on the big green egg since then. I have a lot of different cookers so I cook a lot of different uh, ways. So I, but I've used the big green egg several times and um, so I've had a couple people say, hey, whatever happened to the crack? Is, is everything still okay? Is it working? So yes, I'm going to take you out here to the Big Green Egg. I'm gonna show you exactly what it looks like today, two years later, so you too can see uh, what that uh, repair did. So let's go out to the egg and I'm gonna show you what that repair looks like. Okay, we have all of the pieces out of the egg there. You see uh, all of the guts uh, that go inside the Big Green Egg. So now I'm gonna turn the camera over and show you on the inside of what it looks like. Okay, so this is the inside of the egg. You can see uh, this gray spot right here. This is where that crack was. It ran from that point right there. There's the drill bit that I drilled through and then the crack ran all the way through there, up and over and all the way through. Uh, as you can see, it's held up just fine. Uh, again, I think I've cooked two dozen times on this egg. Um, I've cooked pizzas up to 800 degrees. Um, everything else, long cooks. I've had brisket cooks. I've had, um, Oh, I've done uh, ribs on this. I've done several things on this, uh, just testing it out. And I've not had a single issue with that crack opening or any issue whatsoever with it. As a matter of fact, we moved from our previous location. This egg came out of the table, uh, was, was put on a truck, brought over, and then brought back and put back in the table. And we didn't have a single issue. So that the repair worked just fine. Uh, again, two years later, and I'm still going strong. Okay, with that, I'm going to get the big green egg put back together. I'm going to get it fired up, get it up, run it up to 350 degrees, because I'm going to cook a chicken on here that we're going to use to make a chicken pot pie. Can't wait to show you the recipe. Let's go upstairs and get that chicken spatchcocked. I don't know if you know what that is, but you cut the backbone out of it. So let's go upstairs, and I'll show you how that process is done. Okay, so basically what a spatchcock chicken is, is the spine removed. So you turn it over to the spines facing you, and you cut down one side of the spine using some sharp shears, flip it, and then cut up the spine until you've gotten all the way to the end and the spine comes completely out. Pretty simple process. You just need some sharp shears. Use a knife now to cut down the center of it to cut and split that breastbone and then push it down so that it lays flat. And the idea behind that is, is to get the meat to lay flat so that it all cooks evenly, breasts and thighs. So what I'm gonna do now is put on some gloves and I push down on it to get it to lay flat and I'm tearing or cutting off some of the uh, extra skin. And now what I'm doing is I'm reaching up and I'm releasing the skin from the breast and I'm also releasing it from the thighs. And the idea here is, is I want to get plenty of seasoning up there on the meat itself, on both the, both the breasts and the thighs. I'm leaving the skin on because leaving the skin on helps uh, maintain the moisture of the chicken. So I'm using a salt, pepper, garlic combination there, AP rub, and then I'm coming back with a Italian seasoning that has a lot of garlic in it, a lot of Italian, obviously, seasonings in it. And then I'm getting both sides of this thing completely and totally uh, seasoned up so that we can turn around and get this thing out onto the big green egg, get it cooked up, and then shred it up and put into our iron skillet pot pie casserole. Okay, so we have the big green egg up and running. You guys know I love my fireboard uh, to start my big green egg. I got the fan blowing down there. I've got it set at 350 degrees to get it up to temp. 
We're going to let the big green egg come up to temp. And then as soon as that's done, we'll get the egg, we'll get the uh, chicken put on there. Looking forward to it. All right, so we have the big green egg holding steady at 354 degrees. I'm going to get the other probe out. Get it ready to go into the bird. While I put that on the egg. And then I'll get that plugged in here as well. Okay, here we go. Let's get that bird on. Get it right there in the middle. Everything laid flat. Let me get something to move that. That's screaming hot. Okay. Let me get this plugged in. And we'll put that right in the middle of the breast. Get that lid closed and off we go. This is the beauty of the Firebird system. So now I have two probes in. I have the probe, the first one that's uh, monitoring the temperature of the inside of the egg. The second one now monitoring the temperature of the actual uh, bird itself. And I had the lid open, it had dropped down to 200. Now the fan's blowing, it's bringing the temperature right back up to 350 and it'll settle right up between 345 and 360 degrees right in there. And it'll bring it down to 350. I love this thing. Okay, so it's time to start talking about how we put this casserole together. So I'm using a cast iron dish there you see on the stove. You're going to need one half stick of butter. Take that uh, butter and get it into your, your hot pan there. Start melting that butter down um, so that you can get all the rest of the ingredients nice and incorporated into it. That's, uh, again, a cast iron uh, casserole dish that I'm using there. Um, you're going to want something that can go into the oven or out on the cooker. You're going to need a cream of mushroom soup can, a can of cream of chicken soup, and then you're also going to need a cup of heavy, heavy whipping cream. And then the main ingredient is going to be three cups of your favorite kind of vegetables. I have carrots, corn, and peas there. Now, originally thought I was going to need two of these. As it turns out, I only ended up using one. And I'll show you that here in just a few minutes. So once your butter is all nice and melted, you're going to want to pour all of your vegetables into your uh, cast iron uh, casserole dish there. Uh, get those things all mixed up nice and incorporated. And then you're also going to want to pour in your one cup of heavy whipping cream. Uh, that obviously will help things uh, from scorching on the bottom of the pan. Also helps thicken everything up. Uh, now you're going to be adding your can of cream of chicken soup. Once you get that in there, you're going to want to turn around and add your can of cream of mushroom soup. Get both of those mixed up into that dish there. Get everything all nice and evenly spread out and incorporated so that it all cooks nice and even. It'll start looking something like this at some point and things will, as it heats, it's going to thicken up. Uh, let that thing sit on the stove and bring it up to a simmer. Um, you're going to want this to simmer for about 15 minutes to get it nice and heated all the way through. And uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and add our seasonings. We're going to add about a half a tablespoon of salt and pepper each. I'm choosing the ground pepper first. Uh, and then you're going to want to go ahead and turn around behind that and add your salt. So I've got both of those put into the casserole. Uh, once you've got those put in there, you're going to want to stir this up, get everything nice and incorporated. And you're going to want to sit and hopefully when you're at this point, your chicken is close to being done because the next ingredient is that chicken. So now we're going to go out to the big green egg and we're going to pull the chicken off. Okay, the chicken's hit 150 internal. I'm going to pull it off of the big green egg. I set it at 150 because I was going to be putting it into the shepherd's pie and it's going to cook for another 40 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. So I didn't need to get it all the way up to 165. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the chicken off, and then I'm going to crank the temperature up on the egg to 375 because we're going to bring it back down here and cook it to its final completion. So let's get that done now.
Okay, so the chicken's off the big green egg. We've got it in our tub there. And what we're doing here is we're separating all of the meat from the bones. We're separating it from the skin. We're just ending up with this nice pile of uh, chicken on the left-hand side there. You can see it all sitting there. Uh, some of it's shredded, some of it's chopped. And we're taking a knife now. We're making sure that everything gets cut, in, cut up into nice bite-sized pieces so that it can be incorporated very easily into the casserole. So now I'm scooping it all out of the tub and putting it into the casserole dish. Um, now we're going to go ahead and mix it all into the casserole dish. I've left it on warm here so that the ingredients can stay warm while I go ahead and put the topping on. So now we're taking the crescent rolls here. And crescent rolls normally come into these tri triangles. So I just started putting them from the edges on in. And I, next time I do this, I'll separate these and, and stretch them just a little bit more. Because it tur as it turned out, I was just a little bit short of getting the entire thing covered with one um, with one can. And so what I ended up having to do is go back and stretch them. I saw, you see me stretching that one a little bit there. So I just kind of went back and stretched them to cover everything. So next time I'll stretch them a little as I put them on. But as it turns out, you can see I only needed one... Um, one crescent can to cover this entire thing. So now that we've got that all done, um, I've taken an egg and I'm going to make an egg wash here. So you get that all nice and incorporated there. And then once you've done that, it's time to spread that over the top. Uh, this helps brown uh, your casserole and your uh, crescent there. Uh, once you've got that all done, uh, it's time then to uh, take it out to the big green egg, put it to 375 degrees, and let's get this thing cut, uh, cooked and done. Okay, the pot pie is all ready to go back out onto the grill. We're gonna put it back there on the green, big green egg for about 18 to 22 minutes until that crescent gets all nice and brown. We'll see you uh, once this is done. Okay, we're gonna sneak a peek. Oh, 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 oh. Look at that. Okay, let's let it finish. Okay, I think this is it. Let's hope she's done. Oh yeah. Let's get her upstairs and get a taste. So there you have it. After about 22, 23 minutes in the big green egg, it got this beautiful golden brown. This thing looks so good. It smells so good. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and taste it. I need to quickly do this because this is dinner for my wife and I tonight, and I know she's been very patiently waiting for me to get this done because it's just taken me some time. So let me get in here, just break through this crust, get a little bit of a, a filling. It's piping hot. Oh man. That is so good. So creamy, so rich. Obviously, this isn't going to help you lose weight, but it is very, very hearty. Very, very good. I hope that you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, holler at me. Uh, this was an extremely simple recipe. You saw all the ingredients that I put in. If you got any questions about how I did it or any questions about the big green egg, you see it's held up really well through everything. So I'm going to transition now to the faith-based portion of my video. I hope you'll stick around and watch that. So uh, again, any questions? Holler at me, like, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. Don't forget, God loves you so very much, and so do I. Until next time. So good. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the faith-based portion of my video, Faith Changes Everything. I am Pastor Richard, and I'm so grateful that you're here with me. If this is your first visit to FCE, welcome. On this channel, I try to impart a message of hope, of love, and I'm here to let you know there's a Savior who wants to have a personal relationship with you. If you've been here before, welcome back. I'm so blessed and humbled to have you here on the channel spending time with me. <coughs> Today, we're gonna to be talking about the truth and what the Bible says about the truth and what it means. But before I start the message, I'd like to say a prayer for the words that I'm about to speak and those that are about to hear them. So if you'll bow your head with me while I pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I'm, I come humbly before you to lift up all of those who are lost, confused and unable to see the truth that you revealed to us through your Son. I pray that you'd open their eyes and soften their hearts so that they may finally understand the depth of your love for them and the truth of your gospel. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to guide them in all truth and give them discernment to recognize the lies and deceptions of the enemy. May your Spirit fill them with a hunger for your word and a desire to seek you above all else so that they may be transformed by the renewing of their minds. I say these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so I want to start the message out today uh, with a verse out of the book of John, John 8, 32. And it says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So before I start um, a word about today's message, this message today is a message about truth. Some things I say in this message might be controversial and they might even offend. That's not my hope. My hope is that because I'm speaking on the subject of truth and that I be truthful in all aspects of the truth, which includes the good and the bad. Another thing, if you've been here before, you know that I am bound by scripture. I don't make anything up. I'm, everything I say is scripture based. And so when I wrote this message, I was inundated with scripture on truth. So there are a lot of verses in this message, more than normal probably. I think that speaks to the core of what God has put on my heart to make sure you hear the truth. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Ask anybody today what is truth and you're likely to start an interesting conversation. Try it on social media and you're probably gonna get laughed at, scoffed at, <clears throat> tossed aside. The concept of truth has clearly fallen on hard times and the consequences of rejecting it are ravaging human society. So let's go back to the starting point and answer the question, what is truth? One of the most profound and internally significant questions in the Bible was posed by an unbeliever, Pontius Pilate. Pontius is the man who handed Jesus over to be crucified. He turned to Jesus in his final hour and he asked, what is truth? It was a rhetorical question, a cynical response to a question posed earlier to Jesus when Pilate asked him, you are king then? You can certainly feel the implied sarcasm in that question. We read in John 18 verse 37, Jesus answered, you say that I am king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. 2,000 years later, the whole world breathes Pilate's cynicism. Some say truth is a power play, a meta-narrative constructed by the elite for the purpose of controlling the ignorant masses. To some, truth is subjective. The individual world of preference and opinion, some say. Others believe truth is a collective judgment, the product of cultural consensus, and still others flat deny the concept of truth altogether. So again, what is truth? Here's a simple definition drawn from what the Bible teaches. It's kind of an amalgamation of some of the verses. Truth is that which is consistent in the mind, in the will, in your character, in your glory and being of God. Even more to the point, truth is the self-expression of God. That's a biblical meaning of truth because the definition of truth flows from God. Truth is theological. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He was hereby making a profound claim about his own deity. He was also making it clear that all truth must ultimately be defined in terms of God and his eternal glory. After all, we read in Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustain all things by his powerful word. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. He is truth incarnate, the perfect expression of God and therefore the 
absolute embodiment of all that is true. God communicates his truth through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the scriptures. Jesus said of John the Baptist in John 5, 33, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you might be saved, hallelujah. Jesus also said that the written word of God is truth. It does not merely contain suggestions of truth. It is pure, unchangeable, and inviolable truth that according to Jesus in the scripture cannot be broken. John 10, 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside. Praying to his heavenly father on behalf of his disciples, Jesus said this in John 7, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Of course, there cannot be any discord or difference of opinion between the written word of God, which is the scripture, and the incarnate word of God, which is Jesus. In the first place, truth by definition cannot contradict itself. Second, scripture is called the word of Christ in Colossians 3.16. It is his message, his self-expression. In other words, the truth of Christ and the truth of the Bible are of the very same character. They are in perfect agreement in every respect. Both are equally true. God has revealed himself to humanity through scripture and through his son. Both perfectly embody the essence of what truth is. Remember, scripture also said God reveals basic truth about himself in nature. Psalms 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. In his other in, in, invisible attributes, such as his wisdom, power, and beauty, are a constant display of what he's created. In Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Knowledge of him is inborn in the human heart. In Romans 1.19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. And a sense of moral character and loftiness of his law is implicit in every human conscience. In Romans 2.15, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciousness also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. Those things are universally self-evident truths. We read in Romans 1.20, denial of the spiritual truths we know innately always involves a deliberate and culpable unbelief. And for those who wonder whether basic truths about God and His moral standards really are stamped on the human heart, ample proof can be found in the long history of human law and religion. To suppress the truth is to dishonor God, displace His glory. Still, the only infallible interpreter of what we see in nature or know innately in our own consciousness is the explicit revelation of Scripture. Since Scripture is also the one place where we are given the way of salvation, entrance into the kingdom of God and an infallible account of Christ, the Bible, the Bible is the touchstone to which all truths and all claims should be brought and by which all other truths must finally be measured. And an obvious corollary of what I'm saying is that truth means nothing. It means nothing apart from God. Truth cannot be adequately explained, recognized, understood, or defined without God as the source. Since He alone is eternal and self-existent, and He alone is the creator of all else, He is the fountain of truth. If you don't believe that, try defining truth without reference to God and see how quickly all such defini definitions fail. The moment you begin to ponder the essence of truth, you're brought face to face with the requirement of a universal absolute. I mean, there's no other way around it. The eternal reality of God exists there. Conversely, 
the whole concept of truth instantly becomes nonsense and every imagination of the human heart therefore turns to sheer foolishness as soon as people attempt to remove the thought of God from their minds. Jesus said of unbelievers of truth in John 8 verses 42, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come here on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. That, of course, is precisely how the Apostle Paul traced the relentless decline of human ideas in Romans 1, 21 and 22. Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. There are serious moral implications, too, whenever someone tries to disassociate truth from the knowledge of God. Paul went on to write in Romans 1, verse 28, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. When you boil this down to the last, the simple abandoning of a biblical definition of truth and unrighteousness is the inescapable result. We see it happening before our eyes in every corner of contemporary society. In fact, the widespread acceptance of homosexuality, rebellion, and all forms of inequity that we see in our society today as a verbatim fulfillment of what Romans 1 says always happens when society denies and suppresses the essential connection between God and truth. God gave them over to a depraved mind. It is an unescapable truth. If you reflect on the subject with any degree of sobriety, you will see that even the most fundamental, fundamental moral distinctions, good and evil, right and wrong, beauty and ugliness, or honor and dishonor, cannot possibly have any true or constant meaning apart from God. That is because truth and knowledge themselves simply have no coherent significance apart from a fixed source, namely God. How could they? God embodies the very definition of truth. Every truth claim apart from Him is just simply preposterous. Truth is not subjective. It is not a consensual cultural construct. And it's not an invalid, outdated, irrelevant concept. Truth is the self-expression of God. Truth is thus theological. It is reality God has created and defined and over which He rules. Truth is therefore a moral issue for every human being. You can argue all day long the meaning of truth without God. Most of us do. And to that end, we find ourselves with so many internal struggles. Whispers in our ear that we only need to serve ourselves, that the only vestiges of happiness lie in our own minds and nothing else but self-gratification matters. When you find yourself that far removed from the embodiment of incarnate truth, it stands to reason why society looks the way it does today. Social media, something that could be very powerful, bringing souls to Christ, has become the instigator of hate, leading credence to all of that which we now think is perfect. Pride, arrogant, words without constraint, the non-consequential upheaval of one's depraved thoughts, the normalcy of sin, the binding of all that which is true. I close this message with this, brothers and sisters. How each person responds to the truth God has revealed is an issue of eternal significance. To reject and rebel against the truth of God results in darkness, folly, sin, 
judgment and the never-ending wrath of God. To accept and submit to the truth of God is to see clearly, to know with certainty, and to find everlasting life. At this point in my message, I want to invite anyone who might be in a place in their life to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and be saved. It's really easy to do. All you need to do, all you need is the desire to want Jesus to lead your life and ask to be forgiven and believe that he died for your sins and was raised again to prepare a place for you. If you're ready to give this commitment to him, please say this prayer with me right now. Dear God, I want to be part of your family. You said in your word, that if I acknowledge that you raised Jesus from the dead, and that I accept him as my Lord and Savior, I would be saved. So God, I now say that I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. accept him now as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept my salvation from sin right now. Thank you, Jesus, for I am now saved. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Thank you, Father God, for forgiving me, saving me, and giving me eternal life with you. Amen. If you said this prayer and have accepted Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, praise God. The angels are singing songs of glory for your saved soul. As I always do, I encourage you to get into a church home where you can begin your journey with the people of God who will lift you up and support you and be there for you as you walk with the Savior. Get into a Bible study, go volunteer in the community, do all of these things, but remember to abide in the truth of your Savior and He will make the path clear for you. Thank you for being here with me today. Please like and subscribe and help me spread the good word to your family and friends. You never know whose life you're going to save. And don't forget, God loves you so very much, and so do I. Until next time.